So now that we've covered everything that surrounds a prokaryotic cell, we're going to move forward into something involving the movement of these prokaryotic cells. They don't just sit there or stand there and just live. They actually have some capability of moving. And that capability of movement can be broadly stated as a prokaryotic cell's motility. And that's what we'll entitle our next flowchart. Now, motility uh, can be further, let's say, subdivided or understood at a deeper level by understanding a type of motility, which would be taxis. Now, this is not taxis, but taxis. Now, taxis can be defined as a directed movement, meaning that a movement that is chosen to happen. It's a directed movement, not just a random movement, directed movement in response to stimuli. So uh, one of the key things uh, that a living organism is able to do is respond to stimuli. That's something we hear of over and over and over again. And so we definitely have this response to stimulus in bacteria, in prokaryotes, more generally speaking. So in this directed movement, you can either have a positive taxis, a positive directed movement, and I'll explain that in just a second, or you can of course have a negative taxis, a negative directed movement. What's the difference between these? A positive taxis is one that is towards a stimulus, so something like food, let's say, food is, you smell, the bacteria is, somehow senses the chemicals coming off of the food, it goes towards the stimulus, it goes towards in a positive taxis movement, and that would be towards the stimulus something in question. Negative would be away from the stimulus, of course. When would we see this? Uh, if we imagine, let's say, a heterotrophic bacteria versus another heterotrophic bacteria, you're trying to make sure you run away from that heterotrophic bacteria, away from that stimulus that is trying to consume you, that is trying to phagocytose you. So this is our difference, positive towards, negative away. Um, and then uh, a great example of this, more generally speaking, is something like chemotaxis. This is something that we see specifically in bacteria. They go towards a chemical maybe that they like or go away from a chemical that they don't like that might be poisonous, that might be toxic to them. So it's chemo, the chemical is driving this taxis, this directed movement. So that's a good example of the motility seen in prokaryotes. Now, besides taxis, there's also going to be an understanding of something known as the flagella that's very, very important in our overall understanding of bacteria. So let's look at this. Flagella. Flagella is something many people have heard of before, and we're going to initially look at the flagella from a, compar a comparative standpoint. So we're going to make some comparisons in terms of eukaryote, prokaryote, um, and archaic uh, flagellums. Uh, and so the basic idea behind a flagella is the following. It is a common, key word here is common, many different forms of life have a flagella. It's critical, common motility, so motility again is referring to movement, common motility structure found in, as I mentioned earlier, just a second ago, all three major domains of life, right? Found in bacteria, archaea, both of these are prokaryotes, and also in eukaryotes, okay? So it's found everywhere that's living, and that's very, very important because it tells you that there must be a reasoning behind this. Why is this conserved throughout bacteria, throughout archaea, and throughout eukaryotes? There must be something important for it. So now, in order to understand flagella in terms of the scope of this lecture, we're going to be doing some comparisons between the prokaryotes, at least, and the eukaryotes as well. So the first comparison that I want to do in terms of the flagella structure is between the prokaryotes versus the eukaryotes. What is the difference between both of these flagella, respectively? Now, first and foremost, in prokaryotes, it's important to understand that prokaryotes are, are usually smaller than eukaryotes, usually, and uh, because of that, uh, we usually see the flagellum also be about one-tenth as wide. So in pro, the flagella is one-tenth as wide, and it's also uh, plus not covered by plasma membrane. PM for plasma membrane. So the plasma membrane actually extends in eukaryotes and covers the entire flagella, uh, the surface of the flagella. In the prokaryotes, it is not covered by the plasma membrane, sort of a freestanding structure, and it's a lot smaller, one-tenth as wide. In addition, in terms of these two and the differences, they both have different, both uh, respective flagella, have different molecular compositions, 
So they obviously do not have the same components in terms of the molecules that make up each, and they also have different propulsions. Propulsion simply means movements, ways and forms of movement, how something propels itself. The propeller, the propulsions of both of these are different. So is the molecular composition, so is the size, and so is this plasma membrane concept that we just went over. So that's prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. Now, what about bacteria versus archaea? So the, these two are quite similar to each other, right? They both fall under the prokaryotic uh, realm of this world. So what are bacteria and archaea in terms of their flagella? What is the comparison? Well, they, of course, have a similar size because uh, both of these are similar in size in terms of their overall cellular structure. So their cellular component, like a flagella, is probably almost the same size. They actually also have a similar propulsion mechanism. So they move almost exactly the same way. So propulsion, MEC. H for mechanism. Um, but the thing is, uh, a little bit of a difference is that they have somewhat of a different composition. We don't need to know the details in terms of what that composition is. Just know that the compositions are different between bacteria and archaea. Everything else pretty much the same. And finally, the last comparison that we'll do is between bacteria versus archaea which is what we did already, but we're also going to throw in the eukaryotes as well. So all three, bacteria versus eukarya versus archaea versus eukarya. They all, the underlying factor here is that they all have similar functions, similar functions. The flagella move, is involved in movement. It's involved in propulsion. It's involved in motility. That's a function that is similar throughout the bacteria, the archaea, and eukarya. But what's different? The fact uh, that you really need to understand is that the flagella arose independently. Now, this is a, a very uh, interesting fact to understand here, but important also. Independently. So let's write that down. Arose independently. What does that mean? What is this uh, of independent uh, arising? What this simply means is that the structures themselves are analogous. They are not homologous structures. The flagella is an analogous structure in the archaea, in the bacteria, and in the eukarya. They only function the same. They do not have the same common ancestor. They do not have one common ancestor in which all flagella came from. They have analogy. They are analogous, meaning that the function is what's the same. Basic example that I always do with analogous structures is that the bat has a wing and a butterfly has a wing. But both of them did not come from a common ancestor. They both have analogy in terms of the wing. The wing just functions the same way. The flagella just functions the same way in bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, but it did not come from the same common ancestor. So that's what we mean by its analogous nature in terms of bacteria versus archaea versus eukarya. So that's our general comparison of flagella. Now we're going to move forward and go into a little bit more detail of our prokaryotic, uh, of the interest uh, today, which is the prokaryotic flagella. So we'll do prokaryotic. So now that we have a good basic comparative component to understand, we can now delve deeper into the prokaryotic flagellum. Flagellum is the singular of flagella. Now, the prokaryotic flagellum has three major parts. And of these three parts to understand are the motor, uh, the motor is going to, uh, more specifically, we can understand it as rings embedded in the cell wall rings, this is a ring-like structure, embedded in cell wall, and also the plasma membrane. So just a, a side note, a bit of a detail to remember, that these are embedded rings, okay? Um, in addition, another part to this, uh, the second part to remember is a curved hook-like structure. Don't worry, I'll give you a figure to look at to really make sense of this. And finally, the last part to understand is a rotating, I think this is critical in terms of its propulsion, in terms of its function, in terms of its movement, is a rotating filamentous structure. So it's a rotating filament that causes all of this to happen that actually does the final propelling of the cell. So we'll say the rotating filament is what propels the cell. This is something I would definitely remember. And also remember the two other parts, the motor and the curved hook. The filament is of great interest to us. Now, in the prokaryotic flagellum, we're going to conclude by looking at some basic function, a little bit more detail in terms of the function instead of just saying movement, instead of just saying motility. Now, the function of the prokaryotic flagellum is the following. 
in order for it to work, it actually utilizes something that we remember, hopefully from Bio 1, which is an H plus gradient. Hydrogen ions are pumped across the plasma membrane. Okay, this should start, you should start thinking exactly what this is going to cause. Okay, this is going to cause a gradient, right? It creates a gradient. And we love gradients in biology. Gradients are going to allow for energetic uh, events to happen, for something like propulsion, something like propelling a cell, which involves a lot of ATP, a lot of energy, is going to work because we have a gradient that has formed. That gradient has formed across the plasma membrane. Once that gradient has performed, uh, been uh, made, we can now do the following. The H plus itself has to diffuse, right? It has to go back to where it came from. So it diffuses through the motor. So we remember the motor, those rings embedded in the cell wall and plasma membrane. So it diffuses through them. This is not anything new. When it does this diffusion process, it causes a force. It produces a force. And when we produce a force, this is going to have a specific event that's going to occur right after it, which would be turning of the hook. So this turns the hook. So we've come, we've looked at the motor. Remember, that was one part. We looked at the hook. There's the hook turning. And that's going to, in turn, no pun intended, this is going to turn our filament. So this turns the filament. And there's the filament. So we covered all three parts, motor, hook, filament. And if we turn the filament, we propel the cell. In other words, we do an undergo taxis, right? Taxis is directed movement in response to stimuli. And these are the specific steps that are done in the prokaryotic flagellum for that taxis, for that directed movement in order to undergo uh, motility, in order to show that prokaryotic cells are capable of moving so long as the situation presents itself in the following format.